and welcome to episode 109 of the Sports Geek Podcast. This week, I chat digital and tennis with Pete Holterman. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who's walking around while recording to lift his Fitbit steps, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, I am doing the. I am recording while standing up. It gets me a few more steps on my on my Fitbit, but I've just checked it and the battery's dead. So this is wasted walking. Don't you hate that? My name is Sean Callanan. You're listening to the Sports Geek podcast. You're doing that either on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or my favourite Pocket Casts Pocket Cast app. It's well worth the download and come with a lot of new new features. Please let me know what uh, what platform you are listening to it. Are you listening to it on the website sportsgeekhq.com or on your favourite uh, podcasting app? Uh, you can always contact me, Sean at sportsgeekhq.com will get me. You can also get me on most channels at Sean Callanan on the Twitter, on the Insta. Uh, on Facebook as as well, if you can find me there. Here in Australia, uh, the Australian Open is in full swing. I was lucky enough to catch up with Kim Trengove way back in episode 30 to talk about uh, how the Tennis Australia handle the Aussie Open. And uh, this time I caught up with Pete Holterman from Holter Media and ESPN. And Pete is uh, one of the, like I uh, do in the introduction, is one of the travelling circus that goes around from tennis tournament to tennis tournament uh, and helping covering it from a, from a digital and a social point of view. So really unique uh, position that Pete's in and that he works with ESPN working on the on the social and integrating that with the broadcasts um, around the Grand Slams and then in between the Slams he works in a digital marketing and social um, capacity with a lot of the, the a lot of the tournaments of the tour so we talk a little bit about um, uh, the TV social integration component and some of the some of the issues uh, promoting something that's a global game with uh, regional rights, uh, and then also the, the differences around a, a Grand Slam and marketing a marketing event which might be, you know, two weeks or even less, just a week week long. So this is my interview with Peter Holderman, and stay tuned. There is a little bit of a glitch during the interview, and I have no doubt that James, who does the editing of the podcast, will will nail it. So you'll know when know it when it happens. Uh, so here's my interview with Pete Holderman from Halter Media. Very happy to be in the uh, centre of Melbourne in the hustle and bustle of the CBD at the Grand in the lobby of the Grand Hyatt. So that's the that's the nice lobby music we've got in the background. I'm here with uh, Pete Holderman from Halter Media. Have I said that correctly? Is it Halter? Yeah. Halter Media, and uh, you're here for the for the Aussie Open. Um, you're one of the, uh, the the traveling circus that uh, that follows the tennis ball around around the world. Do you want to give people who are listeners a bit of background on, on what your role is and what you do in the world of tennis? Sure, I've uh, been in tennis now for over ten years. Um, I started off working for the ATP World Tour and was with them for about five years doing marketing and communications work, uh, and then went out on my own in 2008 and started my own. PR marketing company and really got aggressive in the social media space as well. Um, and now do that for a number of tournaments around the world, the WTA finals in Singapore, uh, the Western and Southern Open in Cincinnati, uh, and a few other tournaments on top of those. Um, and then here I'm working with ESPN and I help them on the social side with ESPN Tennis, but I'm also involved with being kind of their tennis liaison and coordinating with the agents, the athletes, the tours for access for interviews and things like that. So that's a really unique role in that uh, from the you know from the Holter Media side, and when you're working with the non Grand Slam tournaments um, in you know both ATP and w, uh, WTA around helping them promote the tournament, helping them understand social and that kind of thing, and then you've got the TV side, which is you know second screen experience, engage a TV viewer, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so let's first of all look at the Aussie Open at the minute. So you're working with ESPN. What are some of the what are some of the tricks of the trade or what are some of the things you've learned over the years? Because TV is still trying to work that uneasy marriage with, with social to say, well, we're driving them to this small screen, but we really want to drive them to the, to the big screen. So what are some of the things you look to, look to do with, with ESPN and tennis? Well, uh, it, it's multifaceted. And one of the, the first things to point out about ESPN is that they've been one of the leaders really in the small screen experience, uh, particularly with
with their digital programming. And they have the Watch ESPN app. And it's great for a sport like tennis because every single match from the Aussie Open has been available on Watch ESPN. So if we're sitting there showing some match because it's in some great fifth set, you know, the, the shardy Gulbis match during the first week went deep into the fifth set. So we got it very invested in that match. But you're a huge Georgia Bulldog fan, and you really want to watch John Isner. Yep. It's available to you. So we've really been pushing that second screen for the Watch ESPN app for a number of years. In terms of social, it's really catering to the, the tennis fan. You know, the ESPN broader platforms cater to all sports fans. And, and they definitely do justice to tennis. But if you're a, a huge tennis fan, you're invested in this. You're paying attention from first round of the final every match every day and you want to see the ridiculous plays the controversies all of it Uh, and that's what we try to do is give that outlet where you can have all of that accessible to you on that second screen while you're hopefully watching you know both on tv and on your tablet you're watching watch espn and then you've got the social on your phone yep and and that's the thing um that's the thing that social definitely offers in digital overall is to really hit up that that uh, target, that niche audience, or niche, if we're talking to American listeners. Um, you know, if you're a, a massive tes- tennis fan, ESPN tries to serve all parties. It tries to serve all the all the pro sports. It's now, you know, getting into the EPL and, and football more overall. And so it's very hard from, say, a single account to be saying this is everything um, because, you know, you'll have, I'm an NFL fan and, you know, it's getting to the pointy end of the season. But being able to split out and we uh, to, to be able to focus on tennis is what the tennis fans, you know, they can opt in and get that extra content. Yeah, and you, it follows the model of a website. You go to the website, and there's the home page, and you've got your headlines there. But then you can go to your NFL page, your MLB page, NCAA football, NCAA basketball, tennis, golf, etc. Same with the social presence, and you can get that news that caters to you. And, you know, you keep your voice within the ESPN voice. You, you don't want to stray too far from what the messaging is as a corporation. But that said, you know, we're very aware of the time difference here in Australia. And a lot of these matches are happening at 2, 3 in the morning back home. And there was a blizzard, so hopefully more people were just kind of shut in and staying up all night watching. And we got some more viewers that way. But you know the audience, so you're probably a really hardcore fan or you're younger and it just happens to be on. So we're trying to kind of cater the messaging to those audiences of the diehards or the just passing by because they happen to be up all night. Yeah, and, and the other thing I think with a, with a global sport such as, such as tennis is the fragmentation of the TV rights and the digital rights and where they sit. You know, we're seeing that in, in Australia where Channel 7 have the, have the rights in Australia and, and they've set up a 7 tennis app and they've got the similar streaming that's, you know, that's local, um, which obviously puts restrictions because social is is not it, it's not uh, geo targeted. I mean, you can put in the geo targeting in in Facebook, but you can't take a video, plonk it, put it up on Twitter, and go. That's good because it's a global it's a global play, and there's different rights in Australia, there's different rights in the US, there's different rights in Europe. How does that uh, how does that restrict or or handcuff? I guess all the things that you could do. Yeah, it certainly presents a challenge, and it's understandable given the amount that all these corporations are paying for the rights, whether it's Eurosport 7, ESPN, there's a lot of money at play here and and you want to protect that investment. Um, What we wind up having to do is on Twitter, for example, we'll link to the website. And ESPN.com can geo-target the video views. And we are in a pretty strong position at ESPN because the rights are not just the U.S. It's North America and much of South America. So still can get a pretty good audience uh, for a lot of those videos, but it certainly is a challenge, and it's one that everybody's up against, because you, you see a great play, you know, Gail Monfils when he dove the other day. Yeah, that Superman photo, which, I mean, a lot of people would have seen, you know, the Gettys image that came out, it literally, he is flying through the air, and yeah, I think a few a few paces put a uh, put a cape on him, and it became a meme and that kind of thing. Amazing photo. Uh, but we're yeah. in the TV business. Yeah, exactly. I don't want the photo. I, I want to vine that, but we can't. You know, and it's it can be frustrating. But you got to figure out how can you maximize it around that. And so you absolutely use the video. And you know, we're in a, a position where we can do really high quality screen grabs while our production is going on. So we can turn around that image quicker than Getty can get it edited 
and post it, and then if someone can download it. So it gives us a little bit of an advantage in terms of the immediacy of it. But it is not the same as having the video. Yeah, and, and that is something that... It's, it is evolving. It's not just tennis. So we're seeing the same sort of conversations happening um, with the NBA and the, and the pro sports with you know, MLB and NFL sort of being in that shutdown mode. We don't want vines. We don't want, uh, we don't want uh, secondary content. Uh, we haven't seen MLB be shutting their media partners that were doing vines and highlights and things like that, whereas the NBA has taken a, a far looser, more liberal approach and pretty much it's open season on anything uh, NBA and people are just taking their phones out and vining. And it's going to be interesting to see what what result wins. I mean, because in the end, you know, if, as you're more enamoured with the sport or seeing more highlights, it's going to drive you to the TV. And I think that's something that uh, broadcasters overall, that the people who pay the big money for the rights, and it's their right to say no or yes, you know, to see whether what the NBA is doing has that trickle-on effect to having more people watching or subscribing or, or, or tuning into games. And that's still, you know, it's a case of, the, the digital laws and the digital rights not catching up with the technology. Well, and it could be something that the social platforms respond to as well. You know, you can geotarget when you're in Facebook. Would Twitter ever look into that or Instagram? It'd be interesting to see if they decide to take that. I, I can't imagine they would, but maybe that's a way that this gets resolved because it certainly is something that everybody has to wrestle with and figure out how to maximize what they can do within those restrictions. Yeah, and I think the other thing is it's not only giving the tools, like you said, being able to geotag, which you can do on Facebook, but the other thing, money talks. And so, you know, uh, recently the Snapchat have done that deal with the NFL and they're currently selling ads in the live story for the Super Bowl and doing that as a rev share with, with the NFL. And that's pretty groundbreaking for a social network to be handing money back. Um, so, you know, maybe it's those kind of deals that, uh, that loosen that kind of thing up for, for fans. So you never know where that might take you. And, and it's really smart how they're doing that because the, the Snap ads are so smart for that platform. They're quick hits, you know. It's five, eight seconds. It's not some long, drawn-out 30-second pre-roll before you can watch the great diving shot by Monfils. It's very, very smartly done to hit that audience in their sweet spot. And we'll be, yeah, it will be interesting to watch the conversation around the Super Bowl to see, you know, because there's always that conversation around the TVCs, around the best Super Bowl commercials that come out. Will there be chatter around, you know, the Doritos eight-second spot in the live story? Like, if they, if they hit that mark with the millennials, oh, uh, Snapchat will be just rubbing their hands together. Absolutely. They're looking smarter and smarter every day for hanging on to what they have. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, your other role, the Holter Media side of it, in working with the with the smaller tournaments because it is it is very tough to stay in the conversation you know when because the, the, the tournament based business which is what you're in is a lot of attention over you know two weeks in a grand slam or or a week it's really short heightened attention how does that work in in the social space when you've got things like edge rank that says you've got to keep putting out content you've got to keep your your, your users engaged otherwise they won't look at your content and if you go dormant you know, there's there's an issue there. So, what what do you look at from a from a tournament point of view? I definitely want to stay involved in the conversation. You know, one of the most commonly asked questions to people who work at tournaments is, you know, the the day of the final. Oh, so what are you going to do for the next six months? You know, you you're going on holiday. You're going to just put your feet up. And no, you're working on the tournament all year. It may only happen for seven days, but you're working on a 365 your social should as well. And so we really look to create content and we come up with different themes. Um, Last year for Cincinnati, we did a countdown theme uh, and just tick the days down in the tournament using different imagery. Um, But that tournament's in August and it's nice now because we can kind of react to the Aussie Open and, hey, look at our our defending champions are both into the semis now with the Australian Open. Some pretty easy content there, but when it's December and it's the off-season got to get creative with what you do. And so that's what we've really tried to do for our clients is come up with some new and engaging ways to stay active. Because if you go dormant, you're not going to be top of mind for people. And, you know, when you just flash in there to say, hey, our tickets go on sale next week, you might get overlooked or you're not going to have a new audience to get that message out to. Yeah. And I think it will be um, very similar to a lot of the conversations I've had uh, recently with Brooke Eaton at the, at the Nets is that mix of local versus the global 
like tennis fan base because it might be great that you know the Cincinnati Open has a lot of fans but you want to also make sure that you've got a really good concentration of people in Cincinnati because you know they're going to be the cheeks in the seats they're the people turning up and they're going to be ones that are most heavily engaged I mean you know you can see Melbourne is a buzz with tennis right now because the Aussie Open is here and yeah we'll be following uh, the, the other Grand Slams, but tennis is at its peak when when the t- when the tournament's in town. Well, and it's important from our perspective to not treat every tournament the same. Um, it, the Cincinnati tournament is one of the premier events in the world. It's one of five that has joint men and women same week and the top players from both tours. So we have fans from all over the world, and we're not just speaking to ticket buyers. We're speaking to a global audience. The event in Houston that I do, it's a ATP 250, so the lowest level of ATP events. Um, you know, it's a 3,500 seat stadium. Uh, it, it's just not as big a deal as a Cincinnati, and so we look at that audience, and it's some people from who are just diehard tennis fans, but a lot of it is just the local tournament goer, and it's important to us to understand that about them and give them a little bit more of the here's what's happening in tennis news. We don't do that as much for Cincinnati. Those fans, we don't think, need it. Houston fans, here's what's going on. And we try to tie it back. You know, Jack Sox are defending champion. When he concedes the point to Leighton Hewitt and Hopman Cup, that's a great moment for us to get out there for Houston because he is our defending champion. But it's also the it moment in tennis at that point in time. Yeah, and it's very – I think what you just said there is – you know, defining your different audiences for your different tennis. So Cincinnati has that, you know, uh, global appeal. It's, you know, it's an important uh, important date on the, on the calendar. Players are going there to defend points, all of that kind of thing. It's like you have to attend. And so it has a different audience and you have to cater for those two audiences, your, the tennis fan and the local fan. Um, whereas, you know, Houston is more in that local focus and almost in that educating mode. You know, you want to get someone to their first... A tennis tournament, that's how you go about doing it. And that's actually where we go back to Facebook and the fact that you can geotag things. You can cater a message specific to that Cincinnati ticket buyer versus doing something that's more broad. You know, So if there's something going on in Cincinnati and we really want to push our community involvement, we can do that and localize it rather than having to do that to the global audience. Yep. And that's the thing, you can do that, yeah, you can do that now either just by the targeting or by them pushing it from a from an advertising point of view. So in your time, you know, starting out um, things social uh, in tennis, it would have been, hey, let's get the message out, let's build awareness. How much is that moving from that engagement piece and getting the content out to, you know, one of the themes of the podcast, cheeks on the seats, getting getting ticket buyers, you know, whether it's a 3,500, uh, you know, uh, stadium or, you know, like here at the Rod Lab with 15,000 and, you know, 60, 70,000 turning up every single day. What part of uh, so the advice and the strategy you're giving tournaments is in that ticketing, ticketing component? We're doing a lot to use social to really advertise, show off the tournament. Here's what's happening. And tennis is a unique sport because it's a day-long event you know it's not coming out for a basketball game or big bash league or nfl it's not a three-hour investment you're there all day which gives us a whole lot in the social tool chest because we can talk about here's all the food we have there are fashion shows going on there's all that other event around the actual tournament that you can really push and use that to track the audience so socially you want to show that off as much as you can and you know you, i had a conversation a few years ago somebody was talking about well we could get a a billboard in times square and i said yeah, you could it's pretty expensive and you have no metrics yeah or we could we could send something out to to mothers of of teenagers that we know play tennis um, and actually get them to, you know, and we can tell you exactly how many we saw and how many clicked through and at a fraction of the cost. And we can go and, you know, follow up and say, hey, we saw you open the email, but you haven't purchased yet. What can we do? You know, you can then take it to the next level, follow up email, get on the phone and really push the sales that way because you're going to know exactly who's looked at it. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, to me, that's the, the opportunity. And I think one of the places where um, tennis is is leading and definitely here in Australia the Aussie Open do a great job in the whole event experience and you know experiential marketing 
is sort of a new thing. Like it's it's a bit of a bit on trend at the minute, and you've got to provide the whole experience, the customer experience, and that's what tennis has been doing. You know, everyone knows about the uh, you know the strawberries and cream at Wimbledon. You know, the Aussie Open's been activating the the Oval, and this I, you know I know friends of mine who haven't seen a a game of tennis, but they've gone and sat sat down and drunk beers, watched on the big screen, then then seen a then a, seen a concert. So it's not just a tennis experience. So you get to that's where I think tennis does a really good job of selling the the, the total experience because you're not just going to consume the one sport, which could be an hour match to a five hour match. And, and the big buzzword for the WTA right now is fan engagement and. There's so many opportunities within tennis where you can do things that you can't necessarily do in other sports. Um, in Cincinnati, every single match on the stadium court has a fan doing the coin toss. Yeah. And it's great for the title sponsor because you have to sign up and, hey, give us your contact info so we can call you if you're selected. How great is that for them that they now have this catch of data where they can follow up with potential customers? It's a win-win, and the fans go down there, and they get to participate in this coin toss, and they're loving it. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! Thank you very much, uh, John McEnroe. Yes, uh, cannot be serious. It, it was one of those times where it wasn't a fake, hey, we'll, we'll run the tape. There was a problem. We actually did just run out of battery. So we just ran down to the nearest 7-Eleven and we've changed venues. Uh, so, Pete, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me a second time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're a little bit puffed on this episode uh, in the second half. You were just talking about uh, uh, Cincinnati and fan engagement, the opportunity for data capture, you know, the whole fan engagement aspect of the total experience. And, you know, people have asked me about the term fan engagement. I think it gets adopted far too much just in digital when it's really, you know, total customer experience you want to sort of what's tennis's take on on fan engagement overall well and as i mentioned before you know tennis is a unique sport because the time spent on site is so much greater than in a lot of other sports and we do a lot in tennis to create opportunities for the fans to do more things on site and the wta going as far as pulling fans out of the crowd after practice to knock up for five minutes with the the player um at, at a lot of the venues there's a great emphasis on the practice courts yep so you're there to watch the matches but you can then go see some other stars who aren't playing getting ready and practicing warming up for their matches um they've done a great thing here in tennis australia for the australian open two of the primary practice courts now have plexiglass black wall, back walls yep so you can sit right behind the player and it's a fascinating view you can see because it's effectively the broadcast view isn't it that's where the broadcasters sit a lot of the times for a, for a major match correct correct so it's a it's a great angle and to see the way the ball moves it's not a straight bounce it's moving when it comes off uh, the court um so things like that and it's as autograph friendly as any sport because most of the players will lot some time at the end of the practice they're going to go sign autographs uh, even just where they come and go and since Cincinnati, we have a, an, an entryway where the players walk through a gaggle of fans every time they come into the venue. Yep. And the fans just congregate there, and the players know it, and they stop, and they sign autographs every time they come through. Oh. It's great access. I mean, and obviously, and obviously it is, because I, I saw uh, the Herald Sun, the, the paper here in Melbourne, uh, has, a, has an online store, merchandise store, and they're always putting out these ridiculous merchandise offers, signed memorabilia offers, and they're normally you know, out of reach of most, most people in there to go up in the pool room or, or, or the study. And they were offering at the start of the Australian Open tournament a uh, tennis ball signed by Leighton Hewitt for ninety five dollars, which is you know which is a really low price point. And it's like you think, oh, that's really good value. And they like, actually, if I wanted Leighton Hewitt's signature, I could go and get it. It's the, like tennis players are that accessible in in that way, you know, because they're walking from to, uh, court to court. And if you're an avid fan, you can you can you can find them and reach them. Yeah, and you think about some of the other sports. I mean, NFL in in the states. Those guys come in in a bus underneath the stadium. They're never accessible. They are on the other side of a wall and usually way down from where any fan can ever get to. It's just a completely different experience at tennis or you know even golf. Tiger Woods is going to stay inside the ropes unless he's got an errant shot. Yep. Which it's, is happening more often these days, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> he's usually not amenable to an autograph when he's <laughs> trying to find his ball under the tree. Yeah, that, that, that is true. Uh, I guess one more thing. Uh, you were just talking about the... Um, 
uh, the practice courts. And we definitely touched on it earlier around broadcast rights, what you can and can't do. Uh, just in the last couple of days, uh, per- uh, Periscope and uh, GoPro have announced a, a partnership where you can effectively connect your pro- uh, GoPro straight to straight to Periscope. Um, and, you know, the use cases in sports are, are endless. Like you could put a GoPro on a practice court and just let anyone watch practice court 18. Um, or you could have a GoPro that's pointing directly at a, a supporter group in a stadium so you can see the vibe if you wanted to, um, which are all great ideas. And we have, you know, I talked to you, but, oh, this is great. Isn't it? And, it, and it becomes down to a, a broadcast thing where, you know, there's a boundary around what can be covered and what can't be covered. Um, it will be interesting to see how those developments, you know, this is a two-day-old technology, um, how those developments get get added to the roster and, and who gets to, to take part in that kind of stuff. And it's been something in tennis, the, the digital side of things, where more and more traditionally print outlets are adding video content. And sorry, New York Times, you can't be doing video content from the Australian Open because yep. those rights have been purchased by someone else. And um, the, the No Challenges Remaining podcast, a great tennis podcast, they are doing Periscope now, and they were kindly told, can't do this from within the grounds of the Australian Open. So they're doing their podcast from the tram stop every night outside yep. the grounds. Well, and, and yeah, and that's the thing. It's both a new and old media that are figuring out um, you know, what they can and can't do. And, and the thing is, it's... It, it is a case by case, sport by sport, what their rules allow, um, and you know what they you know what they keep an eye on. Because that's the other thing from a tournament rights holder perspective, everyone's going to try to break the rules. It's like how much resource and effort are you going to put in? You're in that whack a mole game of stop, stop, and and chasing them all down. Well, and with the the cord cutting, and I think even more so the cord nevers. Yep. This digital space is going to become more and more important and more of a focal point where they're going to pay close attention to what's happening. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, please, if you are if you're listening, I know there will be uh, a lot of nodding heads listening to this podcast about around digital rights and some of the frustrations. Please uh, send us a send us a tweet uh, at Sean Callanan or at Sports Geek or Pete. How can they uh, how can they get you on the Twitter? I am on Twitter at Holter Media at Holter Media. Um, I'm going to finish off this uh, podcast before we lose battery or something else happens. Uh, luckily that we did lose battery because I think a large dump truck started uh, dumping material near us so we wouldn't have been able to record that anyway. So I've got the Sports Geek uh, starting five. What was the first sports event you attended? That's a really, really good question. I um, presume it was Marquette basketball. Uh, my parents grew up, or went to Marquette, so I grew up around Marquette basketball. I was a ball kid for the team, so safe bet it was probably a Marquette basketball game. Very good. Um, you, know, you, you obviously travel the world around tennis tournaments. So I'm looking forward to hearing this one. There's a lot of foodies who listen that go to sports. What's the favorite food you've ever eaten at a, at a sports event? It's, it's the condiment of choice, actually. Uh, in Milwaukee, secret stadium sauce, which you can put on your brat or your burger, oh, hot dog. It's, uh, it's kind of a barbecue sauce. It's really, really good, and it is indeed secret. They only sell it there. Uh, it, you can get it, though, in bottles. So I've, I've smuggled some back to Florida from time to time. So what's it called? Secret Stadium Sauce. That's it. It's, it's, it doesn't sound right. It does, I mean, I think they need to talk to their marketing. It's, like, it's got a bit of Roger Federer in every bottle. Like, and, <laughs> and it's like a plain white label. It's very, very innocent looking, but it's very good. Uh, okay, I'll take, you, I'll take your word for that. Uh, the first app yeah, that you open in the morning, what's your go-to app when you uh, reach for your phone? I usually go Instagram just because yep. I want to ease into the day. I yep. don't want the hard news or breaking news. I want You want some nice sunsets, some- breakfast, puppies? Pretty pictures, yeah. That's a nice way to ease into the day. Um, so you, you mentioned you put a shout out to a to a, to a podcast before, but is there a uh, for the for the listeners out there? Is there someone you suggest they should follow, read, or, or listen to? Uh, I, you know, Jessica Smith does a great job. Uh, talking all things social and sports. She's now at Under Armour. Um, at War Jess Eagle, for those who, who don't know her on Twitter. But if you're following the uh, SM Sports hashtag, you can't, you can't miss her because she's always providing commentary on what teams are doing, um, how, they're, how, they're, you know, how they're being on brand, um, how they're engaging fans. Uh, very, yeah, very strong on the Twitter side of things. And, and does a lot to look at different things. She did a great thing on you know, how teams are engaging on Snapchat or you know, different platforms, different trends. She does a great job on all of that. Oh, I have been uh, tapping Jess on the shoulder, so hopefully I will get her on the, on the podcast uh, soon. Um, and uh, you know, this one's a throwback to uh, Kevin Durant. Uh, you're the real MVP. But uh, 
What's your social media platform? What would you award the MVP to? Twitter, you know, and, and I think because it's live sport, it's it's just designed so well for that. And it, it, it'll be curious to see what comes of this Facebook stadium and, and how they activate in that space. But uh, Twitter's the go-to. And, you know, if I'm watching a game, I've got that app up and I'm, I'm looking to see, especially for my Green Bay Packers, you know, what are the reporters at the game saying? Because they're going to be a lot quicker on that injury report than the national broadcast would be. Uh, don't get me started. I nearly brought up the Green Bay Packers when you were talking about the coin toss before. I mean, really, we need to get people vetted on how to, to, do, a, to do a coin toss. If you didn't see in the overtime, the coin did not spin. It didn't. It didn't spin. But anyway, the better team. The better team won in the end. You can only. You can only do what you do. But you're you're, you're shaking head as well. Yeah, it, it, it was a frustrating season to be a Green Bay Packer fan. It, it, it was. It was. But then again, you know, you that that it sort of epitomised the season. It's like, oh, we're going to lose, and then Aaron Rodgers. You know, pulls out two amazing passes, and you're in a game that you shouldn't shouldn't be in. Yeah, to to do two successful hail marys in a season is uh, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and, and almost consecutive plays in that in that final game, uh, effectively. Um, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, where can where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, um, so our website is holtermediainc.com. I'm at holtermedia on. Twitter, on Facebook, um, and on Instagram. So come look for me and would love to engage. And I'll be at another tennis tournament soon. So if you're ever around a tennis tournament, let me know. We'd love to catch up. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good luck for the rest of the tournament. Thanks so much for having me. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Pete Holderman. You can follow him at Halter Media on Twitter and on Snapchat. Uh, if you're following me on Snapchat, Sean Callanan, you would have you would have seen when I uh, uh, did the interview with uh, Pete. I'm trying to do a little bit of behind the scenes of Sports Geek and uh, post something every day. Um, so please, if you are listening, please send in uh, send me a snap. I like seeing a few snaps. I've seen a few people prompting me with a few snaps of uh, of the Sports Geek HQ saying, when's the next episode? I like that kind of pressure. I eat that kind of pressure for breakfast. So uh, send in a snap, whether it's one that's prompting me to do one, or as Shane Harmon did recently, sent me one uh, halfway through his run. Uh, it's the first time I've had a review uh, with heavy breathing, bre- heavy breathing. So thank you very much, Shane. Um, question for the podcast. Uh, it sort of comes at the end of that conversation with Pete. Uh, recently announced uh, GoPro and Periscope um, teaming up to allow you to quickly live uh, live stream uh, any any GoPro footage, and um, as we sort of discussed, we can do things like uh, put it focused on the crowd and those kind of things. But there's obviously restrictions around uh, broadcast rights. So, so what do you think? How can sports teams use uh, GoPro and uh, and Periscope? Because that's real. It is. It comes down to how you know the use cases. A lot of these things get uh, partnerships get developed, but it's really the innovation that sports teams and digital departments make that will make this a success. Just because it's a, a, a smart partnership makes sense as far as the technology. It all comes down to the content and uh, what you point the camera too just because you've got a fancy camera doesn't mean it's going to be uh, going to be good content so again if you've got a if you've got an answer to that question uh, please send me a tweet and with your ideas or alternatively join our slack community i'm now promoting our slack community as the largest slack community in sports business uh, that's because it's the only one um, but at the moment yeah getting a few people added every day and it's a real global mix of sports executives so if you're interested in learning a little bit about Slack and how to use Slack, um, it works. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan. I'm using it across multiple businesses and projects and clients at the minute. Um, all you have to do to get involved is go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Slack um, and uh, I'll send you an invite and you can join in the conversation. Currently, we've got conversations uh, happening on uh, sponsorship, social uh, we've got some. Uh, we had some really good co- conversations. We have a weekly weekend uh, question where we had a little bit of a conversation about Snapchat. Um, so yeah, it's just a little bit of backwards and forwards. People sharing what they're reading and some of the hot topics. Um, so if you want to get involved there, please go to sportsgeekhq.com/slack. And yeah, on this on the Snapchat just early this morning, I saw a couple of posts go out. Um, it looks like Snapchat has launched uh, the ability to send out a link and automatically allow someone to follow you. So currently, we've got Snap codes where someone can take a photo of a Snap code. 
and we've got something coming out soon that uh, got a quick ebook coming out soon that's uh, going to share some of that type of stuff but now you can simply just go snapchat.com slash ad slash your name so slash ad slash Sean Callanan and if you open that on a mobile open it up in Snapchat and it'll add that person um, if you're already following that person it doesn't give you much feedback so it's obviously really new um, so my, you know my improvement to Snapchat uh, if they're listening uh, is take take you straight to your story that would be the that would be the smartest thing but I think that's going to really help with growth um, and really get people mainstream uh, people on board with Snapchat so it'll be interesting to see again if you uh, if you're snapping away and you're listening Send us a snap. Tell us you've listened to the. Tell us you listen to the podcast. Uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, my name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek. Uh, as I said, you can catch me on all forms uh, at Sean Callanan on most platforms. Thank you very much to former guest Rich Clark uh, from Arsenal, who's now based out of Colorado with the Rapids. He went to a NHL game and caught the Colorado Avalanche versus the Nashville Predators and. Uh, he captured the moment when the Landeskog, and I hope I've got his name right, uh, put the Avalanche ahead 3-2. So again, if you've got a sounds of the game, whether it be an Instagram pic, uh, Instagram video, or a Twitter video, or, or just some audio, uh, yes, either ping me, tag me on it, or uh, uh, send it, just send it to me via email, and include it in the end of the podcast. I've got a couple that have been queued up. Thank you, Todd. Got that one. Uh, we'll use that one in the future. Uh, until next week. My name is Sean Callanan and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Like the Sports Geek Podcast? Find us on Facebook.com slash Sports Geek. Check out which teams work with Sports Geek at SportsGeekHQ.com slash clients. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to SportsGeekHQ.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.